everybody, it's Rose, and I'm back to continue reading the book Replay by Ken Grimwood. If you're coming to this in the middle of the book, you can find the playlist up in the little eye up above. I will also add a link to that playlist at the very end of this video so that you can uh, check out any future chapters that I have um, in the playlist for this book. Down in the description for this video, I will include uh, the link to this playlist, but also the link to um, any other playlists for books that I have already read or the ones that I have on my upcoming reads list. Okay. If you have suggestions for books that you'd like me to read, send me an email or leave me a comment down below. Okay, so we're going to get straight into reading chapter three. The girl at the front desk at Harris Hall was obviously annoyed that she'd drawn Saturday night reception duty, but was taking her weekend entertainment where she could find it, observing the rituals of her peers. She gave Jeff a coolly appraising stare when he walked in, and her voice carried a tinge of sarcastic amusement when she called upstairs to tell Judy Gordon her date was here. Maybe she knew Judy'd been stood up the night before. Maybe she'd even listened in on the conversation when Jeff had called from the gas station near Macon this afternoon. The girl's enigmatic half-smile was a little unnerving. So he took a seat on one of the uncomfortable sofas in the adjoining lounge, where a ponytailed brunette and her date were playing heart and soul on an old Steinway near the fireplace. The girl smiled and waved at Jeff when he came into the room. He had no idea who she was, probably some friend of Judy's whom he'd long since forgotten about, but he nodded and returned her smile. Eight or nine other young men sat scattered around the airy lounge each a respectful distance from the others. Two of them carried bunches of cut flowers, and one held a heart-shaped box of Whitman's candies. All wore stoic expressions that did little to mask their eager but nervous anticipation. Suitors at the gate of Aphrodite's temple, untested claimants to the favors of the nymphs within this fortress. Date night, 1963. Jeff remembered the sensation all too well. In fact, he noted wryly, his own palms were damp with tension, even now. Soprano laughter came from the stairwell, floated into the lobby. The young men straightened their ties, checked their watches, patted tufts of hair into place. Two girls found their escorts and led them through the door into the mysterious night. It was 20 minutes before Judy emerged her face set in what was clearly intended to be a look of frosty determination. All Jeff could see, though, was her incredible youthfulness, a vernal tenderness that went beyond the fact that she was still in her teens. Girls, women her age in the 80s, didn't look like this, he realized. They simply weren't this young, this innocent. Hadn't been since the days of Janis Joplin, and certainly weren't in the aftermath of Madonna. So, Judy said, I'm glad to see you could make it tonight. Jeff pulled himself awkwardly to his feet, gave her an apologetic smile. I'm really sorry about last night, he said. I wasn't feeling very well. I was in a strange mood. You wouldn't have wanted to be with me. You could have called, she said petulantly. Her arms were crossed under her breasts, highlighting those demure swells beneath the Peter Pan blouse. A beige cashmere sweater was slung over one arm, and she wore a madras skirt with low-heeled ankle-strap shoes. Jeff caught the mixed aromas of Lanvin perfume and a floral-scented shampoo, found himself entranced by the blonde bangs that danced above her wide blue eyes. I know, he said, I wish I had. Her expression eased, the confrontation over before it had begun. She'd never been able to stay angry for long, Jeff recalled. 
You missed a really good movie last night, she said, without a trace of sullenness. It starts off where this girl is buying these birds in a pet shop, and then Rod Taylor pretends like he works there, and... She went on to recount most of the plot as they walked outside and got into Jeff's Chevy. He feigned unfamiliarity with the twists and turns of the story, even though he'd recently seen the movie on one of HBO's periodic Hitchcock retrospectives. And, of course, he'd seen it when it first came out, seen it with Judy, seen it 25 years ago last night in that other version of his life. And then this guy goes to light a cigar at this gas station, but, well, I don't want to tell you anything that happens after that. It'd spoil it for you. It's a really spooky movie. I wouldn't mind going to see it again if you want to. Or we could go see Bye Bye Birdie. What do you feel like? I think I'd rather just sit and talk, he said. Get a beer someplace. Maybe a bite to eat? Sure, she smiled. Moe's and Joe's? Okay, that's on Ponce de Leon, right? Judy wrinkled her brow. No, that's Manuel's. Don't tell me you forgot. Take a left, right here. She turned in her seat, gave him an odd look. Hey, you really are acting kind of weird. Is something wrong? Nothing serious. Like I told you, I've been feeling a little off kilter. He recognized the entrance of the old college hangout, parked around the corner. Inside, it didn't look quite the way Jeff remembered it. He'd thought the bar was on the left as you went in the door, not the right. And the booths seemed different somehow, too. Higher or darker or something. He led Judy toward a booth in the back, and as they approached it, a man about his own age, no, he corrected himself, a man in his early 40s, an older man, slapped Jeff's shoulder in an amiable manner. Jeff, how goes it? Who's your lovely young friend? Jeff looked blankly at the man's face. Glasses, salt and pepper beard, wide grin. He looked vaguely familiar, but no more. This is Judy Gordon. Judy, uh, I'd like you to meet Professor Samuels, she said. My roommate has you for medieval lit. And her name is Paula Hawkins. The man's grin widened further, and he nodded twice. Excellent student. Very bright young lady, Paula. I trust my class comes recommended. Oh, yes, sir, Judy said. Paul has told me all about you. Then perhaps we'll be blessed with your own delightful presence in the fall. I can't rightly say just yet, Professor Samuels. I haven't really decided on my schedule for next year. Drop by my office. We'll discuss it. And you, Jeff. Good job on that Chaucer paper. But I had to give you a B for incomplete citations. Watch that next time, will you? Yes, sir. I'll remember. Good, good. See you in class. He waved them off, went back to his beer. When they got to the booth, Judy slid in next to Jeff and started giggling. What's so funny? Don't you know about him, Dr. Samuels? Jeff hadn't even been able to recall the professor's name. No. What about him? He's a dirty old man. That's what. He chases after all the girls in his classes. The cute ones, anyway. Paula said he put his hand on her thigh one time after class, like this. She put her girlish fingers on Jeff's leg, rubbed it, and squeezed. Can you imagine? She asked in a conspiratorial tone. He's older than my father, even. Drop by my office. Ha! I know what he'd want to discuss. Isn't that just the most disgusting thing you've ever heard? A man his age acting like that? Her hand still rested on Jeff's thigh, an inch or so away from his growing erection. He looked at her innocent round eyes, her sweet red mouth, and had a sudden fantasy of Judy going down on him right there in the booth. Dirty old man, he thought, and laughed. What's so funny? she asked. Nothing. You don't believe me about Dr. Samuels, do you? I believe you. No, it's just... You, me, everything. I had to laugh, that's all. What do you want to drink? The regular. A triple zombie, right? The worried look left her face, and she laughed along with him. Silly, I want a glass of red wine, just like always. Can't you remember anything tonight? 
Judy's lips against his were as soft as he had imagined, had remembered. The fresh scent of her hair, the youthful smoothness of her skin excited him to a degree he hadn't felt since the early days with Linda, before their marriage. The car windows were down, and Judy rested the back of her head on the cushioned door frame as Jeff kissed her. Andy Williams was singing The Days of Wine and Roses on the radio, and the fragrance of dogwood blossoms mingled with the scent of Judy's soft, clean skin. They were parked on a wooded street a mile or so away from the campus. Judy had directed him there after they'd left the bar. The conversation tonight had gone better than Jeff had expected. Basically, he'd followed Judy's lead as they talked, let her be the one to mention names and places and events. He'd reacted from memory or the cues he took from her expression and tone of voice. He'd made only one anachronistic slip. They'd been talking about students they knew who were planning to move off campus next year, and Jeff had said he might sublet a condo. She'd never heard the word, but he quickly explained it away as something new from California that he'd read about and thought maybe they'd build in Atlanta soon. As the evening had gone on, he'd relaxed and begun to enjoy himself. The beers had helped, but mainly it was just being close to Judy that had set his mind at rest for the first time since this whole thing had started. At moments, he'd found himself not even thinking of his future slash past. He was alive. That was what mattered. Very much alive. He brushed Judy's long black hair from her face, kissed her cheeks and nose and lips again. She gave a low moan of pleasure, and his fingers slid from her breast to the top buttons of her blouse. She moved his hand away, back to her covered breast. They kissed for several moments more, and then her hand was on his thigh, as it had been in the booth at the bar, but moving purposefully higher until her delicate fingers caressed and kneaded his firm penis. He stroked her nylon calves, reaching beneath her skirt to feel the soft skin above the tops of her stockings. Judy disengaged herself from his embrace, sat up abruptly. Give me your handkerchief, she whispered. What? I don't. She plucked the white handkerchief from his jacket pocket, where he tucked it automatically as he dressed in the outmoded clothes earlier tonight. Jeff reached for her again tried to pull her toward him, but she resisted. Shh, she whispered, then smiled sweetly. Just sit back and close your eyes. He frowned, but did as she asked. Suddenly, she was unzipping his pants and pulling his erection free with a sure, practiced move. Jeff opened his eyes in surprise, saw her staring out the window as her fingers moved on him in a constant rhythm. He stopped her hand, held it still. Judy, no. She looked back at him with concern. You don't want to tonight? Not like this. He gently took her hand away, adjusted himself, and closed his pants. I want you. I want to be with you. But not this way. We could go somewhere. Find a hotel, or... She drew back against the car door, gave him an indignant glare. What do you mean? You know I'm not like that. All I mean to say is that I want us to be together in a loving way. I want to give you... You don't have to give me a thing! She wrinkled her face, and Jeff was afraid she would start to cry. I was trying to relieve you, just like we've done before. And all of a sudden, you take it the wrong way and want to drag me off to some cheap hotel. Treat me like a, a, a prostitute. Judy, for Christ's sake, it's not like that at all. Don't you understand? I want to make you happy, too. She took a lipstick from her purse, twisted the rearview mirror angrily so she could apply it. I'm perfectly happy just the way we've been, thank you very much. Or at least I was until tonight. Look, I'm sorry I said anything, okay? I just thought, you can keep your thoughts to yourself and your hands too. She flipped on the overhead light, glanced at her thin gold watch. I didn't mean to upset you. We can talk about it tomorrow. I don't want to talk about it. I just want to go back to the dorm right now. That is, if you can remember how to get there. After he dropped Judy off at her dorm, he found a bar on North Druid Hills Road near the new Lenox Square shopping center. 
it didn't seem to be the sort of place where he was likely to encounter anyone from Emory. This was a drinker's bar, a hangout for an older, quieter crowd seeking only an hour's escape from thoughts of mortgages and stale marriages. Jeff felt right at home, though he knew he didn't look as though he fit the clientele. The bartender even carded him, and Jeff managed to find the altered ID he'd once kept in the back of his wallet for such infrequent occasions. With a dubious grunt, the man brought Jeff a double Jack Daniels and went off to fiddle with the horizontal hold on the black and white TV set above the bar. Jeff took a long sip of his drink, stared blankly at the news. There was more trouble in Birmingham. Jimmy Hoffa had been indicted on jury tampering charges in Nashville. Telstar 2 was about to be launched. Jeff thought of Martin Luther King dead in Memphis. Hoffa, mysteriously gone from the face of the earth, and a sky full of communication satellites saturating the planet with MTV and reruns of Miami Vice. Oh, brave new world. The night with Judy had begun pleasantly enough, but that final scene in the car had left him depressed. He'd forgotten how artificial sex used to be. No. Nope not forgotten he'd never fully realized it not when those things were happening to him for the first time the dishonesty had all been masked by the glow of newly discovered emotion of naive but irresistible sexual hunger what had once seemed wondrously erotic now stood revealed in all its essential cheapness unobscured by the distance of time a quick hand job in the front seat of a chevrolet with bad music in the background so what the hell was he going to do now? Just play along? Indulge in more heavy petting sessions with a dewy little blonde from another time who'd never heard of the pill? Go back to classes and adolescent bull sessions and spring dances as if they were all new to him? Memorize statistical tables he'd long since forgotten and had never found any use for so he could pass Sociology 101? Maybe he didn't have any goddamn choice. Not if this phenomenal, grotesque switch in time turned out to be permanent. Maybe he really would have to go through it, all of it, again, year after painful, predictable year. This alternate reality was becoming more concrete by the moment, ever more entrenched. That other self of his was the falsehood now. He must accept the fact that he was a college freshman, 18 years old, totally dependent on his parents and his ability to repeat successfully dozens of academic courses that now filled him with disdain and utter boredom. The TV news was over, and a sports announcer was droning off a list of AA League baseball scores. Jeff ordered another drink, and as the bartender brought the fresh glass, Jeff's attention suddenly focused with laser-like intensity on every word from the ancient Sylvania. Coming into Churchill Downs unbeaten, there are still two Eastern Colts that might give the California Chestnut a run for the money. Trainer Woody Stevens brings Never Bend into the Derby fresh from a handsome victory in the Stepping Stone Prep and with a clean record for 63. Stevens won't go so far as to predict a victory, but the Kentucky Derby. Why the hell not? If he had really lived through the next 25 years, Rather than imagining them or dreaming them, one thing was clear. He had a vast store of information that could be useful in the extreme. Nothing technical. He couldn't design a computer or anything like that. But he certainly had a working knowledge, a journalist's knowledge, of the trends and events that would influence society from now to the mid-80s. He could make a lot of money betting on sports events and presidential elections, assuming, of course, that he actually possessed a concrete and correct awareness of what would happen over the coming quarter century. As he'd recognized earlier, that was not necessarily a safe assumption. Not far off the pace. The horse that just might set that pace is Green Tree Stables No Robbery, who holds the record at 134 for the fastest mile ever run by a three-year-old in New York, and who won the Wood Memorial one week after setting shit who had won the Derby that year? Jeff struggled to remember. The name Never Bend, unlike No Robbery, at least rang a distant bell, but that still didn't sound right. 
Both have an uphill battle against the team of Willie Shoemaker and the Western Wonder, Candy Spots. That's the combination to beat, folks. And though it looks to be an exciting run for the roses among the three contenders, the consensus, and it's a strong one, is that Candy Spots will wear the wreath this Saturday. That didn't sound right either. What horse was it? Northern Dancer? Or maybe Kawai King? Jeff was sure those had both won the derbies, but which year? Say, bartender. Same? No, I'm okay for now. Have you got a paper? Paper? A newspaper. Today's, yesterday's. It doesn't matter. The journal or the constitution? Whatever. You got the sports pages? Marked up a little bit. Braves coming to town next year. I've been following their averages. Can I take a quick look? Sure thing. The bartender reached beneath the place where he kept the garnishes and produced a tightly folded sports section. Jeff flipped past the baseball pages and found a preview of the upcoming race of races in Louisville. He scanned the list of entries. There were the favorites the announcer had mentioned, candy spots, never bend, no robbery. Then Royal Tower, Lemon Twist, no, no, Grey Pet, Devil It Is, never heard of either of them. Wild Card, Raja Noor, uh-uh. Bonjour, on my honor, Shadow Gay, Shadow Gay, at 11 to 1 odds. He sold the Chevy to a used car dealer on Briarcliff Road for $600. His books, stereo, and record collection brought in another $260 at a junk shop downtown. In his dorm room desk, he'd found a checkbook and savings book from a bank near campus and he immediately withdrew all but $20 from each of the two accounts. That gave him another $830. Calling his parents was the hardest part. It was obvious how deeply his sudden request for an emergency loan worried them, and his father was clearly angered by Jeff's refusal to explain any further. Still, he came through with a couple of hundred dollars, and Jeff's mother sent another 400 from her own savings. Now he had to go place a bet, a large one. But how? He thought briefly of going to Louisville and putting the money down right at the track. But a call to a travel agent told him what he'd already suspected, that the derby had been sold out for weeks in advance. There was also the problem of his age. He might look old enough to order a drink in a bar, but making a wager of this size was sure to draw close scrutiny. He needed somebody to front for him. A bookie? What the hell do you want to know about bookies for, kid? To Jeff's eyes, Frank Maddock, at 22, was himself a kid. But in this context, the senior, pre-law student, was an older, experienced man of the world and obviously enjoyed playing that role to the hilt. I want to make a bet, Jeff said. Maddock smiled indulgently, lit a cigarillo, and waited for another pitcher of beer. What on? the Kentucky Derby. Why don't you just start a pool around your dorm? Probably get a lot of guys to come in on it. Be sure to keep it quiet, though. The senior was treating him with an affable condescension. Jeff smiled inwardly at the young man's practiced, if unearned, air of worldliness. The bet I want to make is fairly large. Yeah? Like how much? Manuel's was half empty on a Thursday afternoon, and no one was in earshot. $2,300, Jeff said. Maddock frowned. You're talking about a hell of a lot of money there. I know candy spots is pretty much a sure thing, but... Not candy spots. One of the other horses. The older boy laughed as the waiter set a new pitcher of beer on the worn oak table. Dream on, son. No robbery isn't worth that kind of risk, and neither is never bend. Not in this race. It's my money, Frank. I was thinking of a 70-30 split on the winnings. If I'm right, you could clean up without risking a dime. Maddock poured them each a fresh mug, tipping the glasses to keep the foam down. I could get in a lot of trouble over this, you know. I don't want to do anything to screw up law school. A kid like you, all that money, how do I know you wouldn't go screaming off to Dean Ward if you lost it? Jeff shrugged. 
I guess that's where your part of the gamble comes in. But I'm not that kind of guy, and I don't plan to lose. Nobody ever does. A raucous number came up on the jukebox. Jimmy Soul doing If You Want to Be Happy. Jeff raised his voice above the music. So, do you know a bookie or not? Maddock gave him a long, curious stare. 70-30, huh? That's right. The senior shook his head and sighed resignedly. You got the cash on you? The bar on North Druid Hills Road was packed that Saturday afternoon. The commercial-laden pre-race show blared from the TV set as Jeff walked in. Wilkinson's sword trumpeting its newest product, stainless steel razor blades. Jeff was more nervous than he would have expected. This had all seemed perfect in the planning, but what if something went wrong? As far as he'd been able to tell, the previous week's world events had duplicated the past that he recalled. Still, his memory was as fallible as anyone's, and after 25 years, he couldn't be sure that a thousand, a million different incidents in 1963 hadn't turned out differently than they had the first time around. He'd already noticed a few minor things that seemed slightly off kilter, and of course, his own actions had been drastically altered. This race could just as easily have a new outcome. If it did, he'd be out everything he owned, and he'd skipped midterms this week, putting his academic standing in serious jeopardy. He might not even have the option at this point of buckling down to repeat his college career. He could be out of school on his ass, broke, with Vietnam on the horizon. Hey, Charlie, somebody yelled. Another round for the house! Doubles before they leave the gate! There was a chorus of cheers and laughter. One of the man's buddies said, Spending it a little early, aren't you? In the bag, man, said the generous one. In the fucking bag! On the TV screen, the horses were being shut into their gates, restless, hating the confinement, eager to run, as they'd been bred to do. Anything can happen now, Jimbo. That's what a horse race is all about. The bartender set out the doubles the stranger had bought for everyone. Before Jeff could pick up his glass, the horses were out of the gate, never bend, breaking away as if electrically charged, with no robbery almost at his side. Candy Spots, with Willie's shoemaker coolly astride him, was only three lengths back at the first turn. Shadow Gay was sixth, one mile to go, ten lengths behind. Jeff tossed back a gulp of his drink and almost choked on the near straight whiskey. The front runner sped past the half mile pole. Shadow Gay hadn't gained an inch. A smaller school, Jeff thought. Even if he flunked out of Emory, some community college would probably take him. He could work part time at a small market radio station. His years of experience wouldn't exist on paper, but they'd count for a lot on the job. The bar crowd yelled at the screen as if the horses and jockeys could hear them 400 miles away. Jeff didn't bother. Shadow Gay had pulled up a bit toward the end of the backstretch, but it was as good as over. A three-horse race, just as the odds maker had predicted. Shoemaker took Candy Spots in on the rail as the field turned for home, then moved him back out for the stretch. Shadow Gay was in fourth place, three lengths back, and with that kind of competition ahead of him, he'd never. At the quarter pole, no robbery suddenly seemed to tire, to lose heart for the closing battle. He dropped back, and it was never bend and Candy Spots tearing for home but Shoemaker wasn't getting the final spurt he needed out of California Chestnut. Shadow Gay passed the favorite and bore down, steady and relentless on Never Bend. The din in the bar swelled to riotous levels. Jeff remained silent, unmoving, his hand nearly frozen, though he didn't notice, as it clutched the icy glass. Shadow Gay took the race by a length and a quarter over Never Bend, with candy spots relegated to a close third. No robbery was back in the field somewhere, fifth or sixth, exhausted. Jeff had done it. He'd won. The other men in the bar began loudly and angrily analyzing the race they'd just seen, 
with most of their ire aimed at Willie Shoemaker's tactics in the last half mile. Jeff didn't hear a word they said. He was waiting for the figures to come up on the tote board. Shadow Gay paid $20.80 to win. Jeff reached reflexively for his Casio calculator watch, then laughed as he realized how long it would be before such a thing existed. He grabbed a cocktail napkin from the bar, scribbled some figures with a ballpoint. Half of 2300 times 20.8, less Frank Maddox 30% share for placing the bet. Jeff had won close to $17,000. More importantly, the race had ended as he'd remembered it. He was 18 years old, and he knew everything of consequence that was going to happen in the world for the next two decades. And that is the end of chapter three. So um, I hope you've enjoyed this. And I apologize if I butcher the pronunciation for some of the names of streets and places. I don't know the American South at all. So I'm pronouncing them the way I think they should be pronounced. But a lot of them are French names, and we pronounce them a certain way up here because we're half French. Um, but I know that a lot of places in the States don't. Um, so, uh, so forgive me if I am butchering the pronunciation, and I hope that doesn't put you off listening to me continue to read. Uh, I'm actually now starting to enjoy this book. So I hope you are too. It took a little while to get into it, but, uh, but there we go. I'm going to end this video here and I will uh, be recording right now the next clip that I'll use for chapter four. If you have not subscribed to my channel, why don't you do that now? And that way you'll be notified if you ring the bell every time I post a new chapter or any other kind of video. Also, if you really like what I do, why don't you consider becoming a patron? It costs $2 a month and it helps support my efforts in making videos that you'll enjoy. Thanks everybody. I'll be back with you again really, really soon with chapter four. Bye-bye. <laughs>